I, uh, I love this time of year. It's, <clears throat> there's always a lot of excitement and like in- anticipation around the first couple weeks of January. Um, we're stirred up in a lot of ways. I, I, think, I think it's a time where, as a people, we reflect back on the previous year, and <clears throat> maybe we look at some things that uh, we were part of or that we did in 2017, and we go, I'm going to try to not do those things uh, going into 2018. Uh, maybe there's some things that you want to get better at this year. Uh, maybe there's some things that uh, you want to grow on. Anybody got a bucket list of things that they want to accomplish or see this year? Um, I think that there's, there's some of us here that maybe we reflect back on 2017, and there's some things that we endured in 2017 that we hope we don't have to necessarily endure in 2018. Anybody here? Uh, okay. It's this, it's this time of year where everything gets stirred up, and it's almost like our hearts are ready for something new, uh, something different, a change. And I think it happens in all of us. So if you're, if you're exploring journey for you, uh, I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, my prayer for you is that the questions that you have um, would be answered, that, that God would meet you in that. Um, if, if at the end of last year you started making a commitment to say, I want to follow Jesus, I want to give my life to him and his purposes, my prayer is that you'd be empowered to be exactly who you were created to be, um, that you'd walk in that confidence. And if you've been walking with the Lord for years, decades, uh, I pray that you hear God's voice in a fresh way this year. Um, maybe you've been in the scriptures your whole life. I pray they would come alive in a special way um, this year. We're all hoping to grow uh, in our relationship with God. And that's my prayer um, for us, for my family, for this community, that, that we would hear from God this year, <laughs> that he'd change us. If he doesn't speak, if he doesn't intervene, we're kind of stuck, we're kind of screwed. <laughs> and yet, because he has spoken, and because he continues to speak, uh, everything's going to be okay. That's the good news. A um, number of years ago, an influential church in the Midwest began asking this really challenging question. They, they began looking around at, at all the things that they were doing as a church community, and I think I shared this at the beginning of last year. Um, and they, they started asking this question, are all the things that we offer, from our services to our groups to um, events to serving projects, are they, are they helping people grow spiritually? So this team started asking this question and they started asking their congregation and it was a bit sobering because they didn't really get the results they were hoping to get. And it, this sent them on this study uh, of a thousand churches uh, across the country, uh, over 250,000 people interviewed across denominations, different church sizes, and, and they... They, they went out on this research to try to find the answer to the question, how, how do we grow spiritually? How do we grow in our walk with the Lord? At the beginning of the year, they were asking, if somebody comes into our community at the beginning of 2018, as we end 2018, could they say, I know the Lord more and I'm walking with him more fully? This is the question that they were asking. And when they surveyed these churches, if you're interested in, in the study, the book's called Move. Um, if you like statistics, I recommend picking it up. It's really fun. If you don't like statistics, I wouldn't pick it up. I would leave it on the shelf or in Amazon because it will be really dry. Um, but the study began to reveal some trends. And man, when I see things like this, I lean in a little bit. Because if there's things that are, are proven to, to show some sort of result, I'm like, there's something to this. I want to pay attention. And the results uh, are not earth-shattering. In fact, they're pretty simple, and they're probably things that you'd go, well, that makes sense. But isn't that true about most things? That there's not like a silver bullet that's going to change everything in your life? It's like the simple things that if you do those things, then you'll be able to grow. I think it's true in, in most areas. So here's what they found. Four things they uncovered in the lives of people who said uh, that they were growing spiritually. These individuals could say, I read scripture, I reflect on how the scriptures apply to my life, I pray for guidance, and I set aside time to listen to God. Not rocket science, right? I mean, 
These are, these are things that you kind of would, have ex- would expect. These four things, 1,000 churches, 250,000 people, these four things were helping people grow in their relationship with God. So here's how this applies uh, to our community. Our prayers that we would grow in our relationship with God, and based on this and really history, these things have been common throughout history. We decided at the last year that we were going to journey through the scriptures together as a community. Um, so if you're just joining us, if you're a guest uh, today, or if you just come the last couple weeks, I want to kind of set this up for you. We've, we're using this uh, reading plan from the Bible Project, and it's kind of a baseline for our journey, and it's a reading plan that gives you something to read every, every day. And what's cool about this is our high school ministry, our middle school ministry, and our children's ministry are all utilizing the same reading plan. So today when you leave uh, and you go pick up your kids if you have them, uh, when you go home for lunch, they're going to be talking about the same text that we're talking about in here. So you can share that as a family. You can ask questions as a family. You can ask your kids questions <laughs> as a family. And it's, it's meant to be, it's meant to create some community around the scriptures and help us grow together. Uh, and, and so we're going to journey through this. There's a number of ways that you can engage in that. There's groups that you can join uh, for discussions around this. Um, if you need the reading plan, we have some hard copies at the foyer. You can grab one off the desk. There's an app called Read Scripture. You can just download that. That's an easy way to look at it. If you have version. You can find it in version. Uh, and the other thing that we have is, is if you're just interested in not all that other stuff, but you just want to grab a bookmark that has the reading plan for this week, here you go. Uh, these are available as well. <laughs> They'll be in the back of the room. You can just stick that in your Bible uh, for this week. Um, last week, Pastor Brooks came, a good friend of mine, and he shared uh, about the importance of reading Scripture and some of the challenges that we face in diving into Scripture and it's, a, it's an excellent message. Uh, and so if you have access, check it out on the podcast. If you'd rather have a DVD, John burnt some DVDs. If you want to just grab one, there's some at the, at the desk out there too. Uh, it was a great setup for this year. One of the illustrations that he gave, he said, um, he grabbed his glasses and he laid them on the table here. And he said, you know, if I was to purchase these glasses and just set them on the table and stare at them, Um, You might think that I'm a bit loony if that's all I did with them. The point of glasses is to to wear and to see the world through. And he related that to the scriptures, that as we engage the scriptures, it's not just something to study and to know all the facts. It's something that we begin to see the world through. It's It's this lens that we put on who God is, and that's how we view the world. It shapes our worldview. And so that's what we do uh, with the scriptures. And if you're if you're type A or you're somebody who likes a checklist, that's me. Uh, what we're going to remind each other about throughout the year is that it isn't about a checklist, it's about a relationship. Because when we get to February or March and you've missed a few weeks <laughs> or you missed your reading plan and you start punching yourself like, oh man, I failed. Totally not what it's about. <laughs> it's about this relationship with Jesus. So you can just pick up right where we are and everything is fine. There's no shame in that. So our, our heart is to just engage, and uh, I want to take a minute before we jump into Genesis 1 and, and pray. Lord, we, we pause at the beginning of 2018 because we need you. We look at our own lives, and we know that in our strength and in our ideas, it's, it's not enough. Um, We don't have what it takes to save ourselves, to change ourselves, and we need you. Without your involvement, without your voice, without your direction, we're lost. And so I pray that the word would come alive for us this year and that our hearts would be receptive to hear what you need to say to us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn to Genesis Chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, uh, love to give you one. We got some at the, at the desk out there. It's, it's yours to take. Um, if you like to read on your phone, I'm, that's great too. Feel free to do that. There's no shame in that. Genesis 1. Our first series is called Beginnings and what we're going to address over the next eight weeks 
is Genesis through Deuteronomy. Now, if you have any exposure to the scriptures, that is a lot of material in eight weeks. And so what we're going to do on a Sunday morning is touch down in one or two places in each of the books, highlight a theme or a key idea from the scriptures, and then send you off from here to go read the scriptures in a group or with your family or by yourself. Um, so we're not going to cover everything, and we never could, because the Bible is huge, and there's so much to mine. But we're going to hit a couple things, uh, and today we're going to do Genesis 1, and we'll get into Genesis 50 next week. Uh, as we enter Genesis, a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, when you're reading scripture, uh, a good question to ask is who wrote this? Who was it written to? And what was the purpose of writing this? Those are kind of key things. As you read any scripture, as we engage in any of this throughout the year, um, because if, if you don't ask those questions, you can get yourself into trouble. I'm going to give you an illustration. Uh, this is uh, a Lego manual for an aircraft. Okay? And this was written by the Lego people. And it was written for the purpose of creating this beautiful aircraft. It's also written to uh, children. So, so a child could pick this up, read through it, figure this out one piece at a time, uh, and put together this aircraft, okay? That was the reason that it was created. It came in a box with some pieces, and you put it together following this. If I was to take this, and if I was to drive over to the Navy base this afternoon walk into one of the hangars to one of their maintenance guys and say, got to figure it out, bro. Take this, follow this, and you'll fix the planes for our pilots. <laughs> now, there's a lot of pilots in this room. Would you be comfortable with that? <laughs> That's not what this was designed for. That could cause some serious problems. Uh, it seems pretty ridiculous. Now, that's a good illustration of what can happen when we take Scripture and try to make it do something it was never intended to do. So when we step into the Scriptures, we're stepping into ancient texts, and it is important to understand the context. Otherwise, we misapply it. And it can be damaging. It can be very damaging. Um, so for Genesis 1, for the story of Genesis, um, those questions, who wrote, who wrote it? Uh, many would say that Moses wrote this, and there's kind of a big debate around it. Was it Moses? Was it some authors around Moses? Was it compiled over a period of time? There's some debate about that. Uh, but who it was written to, there's not a lot of debate about. Uh, it was written for the Israelite people. And so it had a specific purpose for the Israelite people. And as we walk through the scriptures, the first five books of the Bible, we're reading about the story of Israel, and if you've had a chance to do that or you've been in church at all, you know that the Israelites were kind of a mess, <laughs> kind of like us. <laughs> so when we read their story, we go, oh man, I can connect with these guys because they're doing their best trying to figure things out and how to follow God, and sometimes they did really good, and sometimes they did really bad, and yet God's faithful in all of it. And so this is their story. What I want to focus on about them is is they had come out of a period of slavery. Uh, if you've seen any of the dozens of movies about Moses going in and delivering the people, the Exodus story, this is the story of the Israelite people. They spent 400 years in slavery, and then they're delivered, and they begin to live in the desert learning about this God. And it's these people who begin to share these stories and hear these scriptures about who their God is. So, we need to enter into that. We need to put ourselves in their shoes. Because if you've been in slavery for 400 years, you start scratching your head about who God is and how much he's involved in the world and how much he cares. Is he even, does he even care? Think about your own life. When something tragic happens, have you ever scratched your head and gone, man, God, where, where are you in this? Like, how are you, oh, how are you overseeing this? How are you sovereign? Imagine 400 years of that, being under a slave master, not really having your own identity, not being able to do anything you want to do because you're owned by somebody. This is the story. So let's get into their shoes and let's read Genesis 1 together. I'm going to have you stand because I'm going to read the entirety of chapter 1. 
So why don't you stand up, because I don't want you to fall asleep. (laughs) Genesis chapter 1. High five somebody, say we're going to make it. (laughs) It's going to be good. Good. Genesis chapter 1. Here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered into one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Good. God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was There was evening, there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth to rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. I like that. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. High five somebody next to you and say, we're almost there. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. To every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for fruit. Lots of salads in the beginning. (laughs) And it was so. God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. All right, fist bump somebody and have a seat. You did good. (laughs) So remember... You're an Israelite, you're in a place where you're kind of struggling to know who is this God, who is he, how does he behave, how does he act, how is he involved in the world, 
what does Genesis 1 reveal? If you're hearing this read to you, what do you learn about God in Genesis 1? Just a few things that I want to highlight. The first is that God was before creation. The opening words of the Bible, in the beginning, God created. This small sentence has great importance because it sets God apart from creation. God was before creation. And for the Israelite people, this would have been a pretty important thing because they were under a culture that was filled with many gods. They were, they were slaves to a man, Pharaoh, who said he was God himself, one of the gods. And so for them to hear that in the beginning, God, that, that their God was before anything else was ever created, it was a distinction that was important for them. There's only one God. There's not many gods. There's one God. He stands alone. There's no one like our God. There's no one that compares. There's no one that competes. There's, there's one God. He stands alone. He sustains life. He provides life. And he holds all of creation. So for them, this is important, but I can say that this, I mean, we can fast forward to today. This is an important truth for us too. We might not have idols today, but we have plenty of gods that we worship. And the truth of Genesis 1 is that there's really only one God worthy of worship. There's one God that's stood apart at the beginning of time and created all things and is worthy of all of our devotion and adoration and everything that we have. And so really, as a people, we're trying to figure out what does it look like to submit and surrender and, and worship and to give our lives to this God, to serve God. And what we'll find is more things about who this God is, and it makes it a little easier <laughs> to jump on board and be a part of that. The second thing that this chapter reveals about God is that God brings order to chaos. The picture described in Genesis 1 is of God, the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the deep, over these waters. And in ancient times, the water was seen as something that was uncontrollable, something that was chaotic, that was scary. And in this first chapter, God speaks and it listens to him. God has the power and desire to bring order. And when he speaks, he does that. That's who God is. Again, think about being an Israelite. This would have been good news for people who were probably pretty unsettled because they were taken out of slavery, which they'd come to understand, even though it was a bad situation. When you're in it for 400 years, it is a way of life. They're yanked out of that. They're taken into the desert to learn about this God that they really had yet to know fully. So how unsettling is that? Everything that you knew, everything that made sense, everything that you had come to believe and accept as truth because for 400 years it had been regardless of what you thought, now you're free from that and you're trying to figure out who this God is that has saved you. And what they hear is that this God who is before all creation, when he speaks, things that are out of order come in order. Things that are chaotic are stilled. This God is a God of order, a God who desires to speak order, to give order. Now for us, I, as, I was, as I was preparing for this, I feel like there's a, a specific word for some of us today. That as you're beginning, if, if you're in a spot where you're beginning a relationship with God, or maybe you've been in one for a while, and it seems like it's a little chaotic, Maybe you've just become a follower of Jesus and you're like, I thought this would be a lot different than what I'm experiencing. Because when God first begins to speak to you, if that's something that's happening in your life where your heart is stirred and your desire is to know him and to understand him and to hear from him, and he begins to draw you to himself, the first thing that he does is he takes you out of slavery. He takes you out of a place where you're under authority that's bad. And then the important work that happens after that is he begins to pull the slavery out of your heart. And that is really the hard work. 
Because God isn't interested in just giving us an external safe place. He's interested in transforming our hearts. He's interested in transforming our perspectives and our ideas. Slavery is something that gets inside of you when you're in it for 400 years. And the people of God needed to be transformed. The same is true today. When God begins to speak to us and draw us out of slavery, he then begins to transform and bring order and healing and restoration at the very core of who we are. And sometimes that work is hard. Because there may be behaviors or activities that you've become so familiar with that are not really part of who you're designed to be, and God begins to address those things. Say, that's not, that's not for you anymore. And he begins to pull that away. And it feels like, oh my gosh, the structure that I get and understand is, I don't like this. <laughs> but can I just tell you, God wouldn't do it in your life if he didn't love you and know that what's best for you. He speaks to those areas of our life. He addresses those things because he's the one that created us and he knows what we're created for. And there's plenty of things that we do that can be destructive in our lives. And God cares enough to speak to those things to bring order. So if you're just beginning or maybe you've walked with God for a long time and God seems to be speaking to you about the same thing and has been for years, it's probably something you should pay attention to. There's some journals that I have. I go back and look at journals over the last 10 years, and it's like, oh, <laughs> I'm so thick-headed. There's, I'll read three journals in a row, and out of those three journals, it's like the same thing for three journals. Anybody else have this phenomenon in their life? <laughs> oh, how am I not getting this? It's so clear when I stand above and look at all three of them. Because he'll be faithful to speak to the thing that he needs to in your life, to bring order. Last thing. And we see in this text, uh, and that's very valuable in light of what we just said about God caring for you. Um, and this may seem cliche, but God is good. Do you notice that we highlighted that a little bit when we were reading? All that God created was good. As he was creating, there was no like, whoops, <laughs> kind of messed up on the hippo. <laughs> like he didn't, he did, this wasn't, he didn't have screw-ups. He didn't have like, he didn't have like subpar thoughts or ideas or actions. Everything that he created was good. Culminating in humanity, very good. And so as an Israelite, you, you're reminded that this God who stands before all things that loves to bring order, his very essence, his very being is to do good things. He, he's a good God. His actions towards humanity are, are good. And for them to think about their history in light of what their experience was, and this could be our experience too. I think it applies to today. When you think about your journey and maybe some of the struggles and the pain and the suffering, you begin to question that. Is God really good? We're drawn back to the beginning of time where God speaks things into existence. Everything that he did was good. Where we get all the other stuff is because mankind began to spiral when they broke relationship with him. So, so mankind, we are the ones that have kind of corrupted things in this world. And what we'll see throughout Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus is that God's movement towards us is always for good, even though we spiral into chaos. I know that all of you guys have walked so faithfully with God. You've never done anything wrong. But aren't you great? That, isn't it good news that God loves you enough to continue to pursue you even in your destructive behavior? Oh, that's good news this morning. That's the goodness of our God. God is good. It didn't take long for things to go south when we took the reins, when we said we can decide good and evil. But we have to be careful not to allow the chaos of our experience to begin to dictate our view of who God is because God is good. God is good. His intentions, his plans, they're good. We'll hit that again in Genesis 50 next week when we look at the end of the story and things have spiraled and yet God's movement is still good towards his people. Let's pray together. Lord, Thank you that these things are true today just as they were then. Thank you for the truth that you reveal through your scriptures. 
I pray today that these things would settle deep in our hearts, that we could hold fast to some of these truths, that even in the middle of chaos and uncertainty, that you would hold fast to us and that we would hold fast to you and that we'd be strengthened. Thank you that you bring order. Thank you that you help in the healing process in our hearts and minds. Holy Spirit, thank you that you're speaking today. I just pray that our hearts would be available to that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.